Paul told the Corinthian church that where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, there's freedom. And you know, the spirit of the Lord is in every place. He's everywhere. There's nowhere physically where God is not present. He's present everywhere. He's omnipresent. So does that mean everywhere there's freedom? I think the key is that this freedom, this liberator, this savior has got to get on the inside. You need to be full of the Spirit. Before you leave this place, you can have the freedom that we're singing and dancing about here today. If you don't have it and you're being honest with yourself, I want you to just allow this preacher to preach to you and let the Spirit of the Lord minister to you. And I promise you, if you give God your heart today, you will walk out of here free from whatever it is you're not free from. There will be freedom. No more depression. No more discouragement. I wish I had a witness. No more anxiety. I know there's more people that believe that. God is the one that can take the spirit of depression and fear and doubt and all of that off of your life and give you real freedom. Amen. If you've been blessed by Pastor Michael and Sister Becca's ministry and just the preaching and the ministry that they have in, in, in this church, will you just let him know as he comes up here and thank God for his ministry by clapping your hands and welcoming him up here. What a beautiful day for a picnic. <laughs> um, this might throw you off a little bit, but uh, you may be seated. The, the, the clapping just there was um, not out of a sense of relief you know, be from standing so long, just to be clear. If you want to know more about it, ask, ask my wife. She can explain it very well to you. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't actually have a, a, an opening text, as it were. Um, so do this a little bit differently. Um, but stick with me here. It's worth it. So I'm not exactly sure of, of the exact origin of this quote, where exactly it came from, but there, there's a quote that says, nostalgia is a powerful drug. It alters our memories and makes us long for the past and at the same time enhances our present. Nostalgia is a powerful drug. It alters our memories and makes us long for the past, and at the same time enhances our present. As my wife can attest to, I often find myself, especially lately, in a nostalgic state. I miss my family being so close, both in distance and in bond. I often get lost in thought, reliving memories from my childhood, mostly memories with my family. I look back on the time that I've spent with my family uh, through through pictures and, and home videos and, and and just the memories and, and I wish I could go back in time and spend more time with them while they were still nearby. I wish I could go back in time and as a child express my gratitude to them. Is another saying that says you don't know what you've got until it's gone. You don't. You, absence makes the heart grow fonder, and and it's not just the the absence in in terms of distance, but uh, the the, uh, the 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 type of relationship that I had with my parents and my grandparents. I wish I could go back in time and express my gratitude as a child and my appreciation for them. Uh, they were instrumental in making me who I am today. Uh, I recently had an opportunity to uh, get into the, the the way back machine, and I got to revisit my my grade school where I spent kindergarten through eighth grade. Uh, there was a surprise um, award ceremony put on by the the principal for uh, many former teachers and staff. Uh, they called it the Legacy Awards at Palmer, uh, the, the school I attended in Chicago. 
and and uh, they they had. <laughs> They had invited all these teachers and staff to come uh, see a, a production of The Lion King that the eighth grade class was putting on and said, we're going to follow it up with the luncheon. What they didn't tell them was the luncheon was going to be full of students uh, from their past that were there to surprise them. Uh, and so I got to, to uh, see my kindergarten teacher again and, and my, my sixth grade science teacher and my eighth grade science teacher and, and some of the staff and, and other teachers who uh, you know, had an impact on my life. And it was just such a great experience to go back to my, my, my school and, and, uh, and, and relive some of the, the, the good memories I had there. Uh, I, I was fortunate enough to have another chance to go to these teachers and staff as an adult years later and tell them how grateful I was for them. What a gift. What an opportunity that, that was. In the Bible, the closest thing we see to nostalgia on a regular basis are altars and landmarks. Altars were built to commemorate a significant spiritual experience that happened in a particular place. It was to serve as a reminder to not only those who built the altars, should they ever revisit them, but also as a memorial to anyone else who may have passed by. And in some cases, there may not have been an altar, but just a landmark, a, a place of significance that would remind their visitors and passers-by of a historical or spiritually significant event. Altars served as a place of worship, a place of reflection, a place of learning from the past, and a place of sacrifice. There was no reason that anyone who visited an altar should have left the same way that they arrived. And so it's with that in mind that I want to talk to you a little bit on the subject altered beyond recognition. Altered beyond recognition. And yes, I do realize it's spelled differently. That was on purpose for you other uh, grammar nuts out there. That's right. In 2 Kings chapter 2, we find Elisha and Elijah not very long before Elijah is translated up to heaven. That means he, was, he didn't really die. The Lord took him in a whirlwind to heaven. Uh, but these are the, the events immediately before this. Uh, so the, these prophets, uh, they visit three locations at the direction of the Lord. The first of which is Bethel. 2 Kings chapter 2, starting in verse 1, uh, I'll be reading from New Living Translation. Uh, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and said, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? He said, Yes, I know. So be quiet. Don't you wish you could tell somebody every now and then, just be quiet. Just be quiet. So let's take a look at Bethel. In Genesis chapter 28, we find Jacob on the run from his brother Esau with a contract on his life. And Jacob is carrying a reputation as a master manipulator who has cheated his way through life. Genesis 28, starting in verse 10, Meanwhile, Jacob left Beersheba and traveled toward Haran. At sundown, he arrived at a good place to set up camp and stopped there for the night. Jacob found a stone to rest his head against and lay down to sleep. As he slept, he dreamed of a, a stairway. The Bible says uh, a ladder. King James uh, talks about that. That reached from uh, earth up to heaven. And he saw... I, I always had this weird visual of that. Like, what was that dream like? There's, there's a stairway or a ladder. I, I, like, when I was younger, did anyone else picture it as an escalator? Yeah. Just... You know, just escalator up and down, angels going up. Okay, cool. It wasn't just me. That's good. Uh, 
So he saw the angels of God going up and down the stairway. Verse 13, at the top of the stairway stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather Abraham and the God of your father Isaac. The ground you are lying on belongs to you. I am giving it to you and your descendants. Your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. They will spread out in all directions to the west and to the east, the north and the south. And all the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. Verse 15, what's more, I am with you and I will protect you wherever you go. One day I will bring you back to this land. And I will not leave you until I have finished giving you everything I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I wasn't even aware of it. But he was also afraid and said, what an awesome place this is. It is none other than the house of God, the very gateway to heaven. So the next morning, Jacob got up very early. He took the stone he had rested his head against and he set it upright as a memorial pillar, as an altar. Then he poured olive oil over it. He named that place Bethel, which means house of God, although it was previously called Luz. Then Jacob made this vow, if God will indeed be with me and protect me on this journey, and if he will provide me with food and clothing, and if I return safely to my father's home, then the Lord will certainly be my God. And this memorial pillar, this altar I have set up will become a place for worshiping God, and I will present to God a tenth of everything he gives me. This altar at Bethel, this is just the beginning of Jacob's transformation. In Genesis 32, the Bible says he wrestled with a man through the night until daybreak, and this man touched his thigh, removing it from its socket. However, uh, Jacob did not relent, and he said, I won't let go until you bless me. That's a really weird thing to say to someone you're in a fight with. You're in a fight with someone... You're, you're obviously struggling. You are, you are trying to get the better of someone. And, and, and the other person says, you know, let me go. Let me, I have to leave. And your response is not like, no, you, you came to me. I, let's go. Let's throw down until one of us isn't standing anymore. He said, I, I won't let go until you bless me. It's as if Jacob recognized he was in the presence of God. And that probably would not have been the case if he had not had that first altar in Genesis 28. If he had not had that first encounter with the Lord, if he had not recognized the Lord, is, surely the Lord is in this place and I wasn't even aware of it. Well, now he's in a situation where he's in the presence of God and he's aware of it. He recognizes it, and so he says, you know what? I know I'm in the presence of God, and so I will not let go until you bless me. When you have a real connection with God, you will recognize when certain struggles in your life are just a matter of learning not to give up until you see a meaningful and tangible change in who you are. Would you clap your hands to the Lord? We pick this back up in Genesis 35. God tells Jacob, you're going to move back to Bethel and settle there. You're going to build an altar to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob told everyone in his household, get rid of all your idols, purify yourselves, put on clean clothes. We are now going to Bethel where I will build an altar to the God who answered my prayers when I was in distress. He has been with me wherever I've gone. And so they got rid of their idols, their, their pagan uh, earrings, and they, they buried them and they set out. And, and the Lord had told Jacob previously, I will be with you. I will protect you wherever you go. Genesis 35 and, and, uh, and 5 says, as they set out, a terror from God spread all over the people in all the towns of that area so no one would attack Jacob's family. Eventually, Jacob and his household arrived at uh, Bethel in Canaan. And Jacob built an altar there and named the place El Bethel, which means God of Bethel. Bethel was house of God. Now, this place isn't just a place anymore. This, this isn't just about 
uh, recognizing and, and, and memorializing the significance of the place. Now it's about worshiping the God of the place. It is about worshiping the God of the house of God. Jacob, who at this point is now Israel, he has gone from uh, memorializing a place to memorializing the God of that place. It's one thing to show up at church and have respect for the house of God. But that's only half the equation. What's the point of showing up if you're not going to worship the God of the house of God? What's the point of showing up to the place? The place is great. We, we need, you know, it's great to have a building. It's great to have chairs to sit in and the sound system. All this stuff is great. It, it helps, right? But what if we didn't have this? What if this was just a piece of land? Could you still worship? Could you still say that, that we may be in a tent, but it's the house of God. And, it, and, and if God shows up, I'm going to worship the God of the house of God, wherever that may be, whether it's at 3030 Central Road, in your home, at your workplace, at your school, wherever the presence of the Lord is, that becomes the God of the house of God. Biblical altars were often used for sacrifice. Oil or wine would be poured out or an animal would be burned as an offering to the Lord. To sacrifice is to lose something. And at the altars of Bethel and subsequently El Bethel, the most significant sacrifice was not the, the oil that Jacob poured out. It was not a, a, a burnt offering that may have gone up in the time that passed. The most significant sacrifice at El Bethel was Jacob's old nature. He was altered beyond recognition. He was no longer the lying, manipulative cheat that everyone had known him to be. His deceitful, lying, manipulative past was just that. It was his past. Jacob was altered, and his legacy and his heritage would be etched in eternity. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Your past is just that. It's your past. God has brought you to this point. He has altered your life through this point, uh, to this point, I should say, based on your past experiences. You, you are not, uh, uh, I've talked about this before, you're not a perpetual victim. You're not a perpetual victim. You, you can choose to live in that state and say, I'm a victim, I all, once a victim, always a victim, or you can say, you know what, I'm going to show up at an altar, and I'm not going to leave until something changes. I'm not going to leave until God blesses me. I'm not going to let go of this altar until I am changed, until I am altered beyond recognition, until the people who, who, who think they knew me don't know me anymore because I'm a completely different person, because I've been in the presence of God, because I've recognized that I've been in the presence of God, and I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that everything I was is no longer who I am. We pick back up with Elijah and Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 2, starting in verse 4. Elijah said to him, stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho and the company of prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? He said, yes, I know. So be quiet. Shut it. Zip it. Hold your peace. This story of Jericho, it's often referred to as Joshua and the walls of Jericho, or Joshua and the battle of Jericho. Yes, the story is famous for the walls falling down, but that's not really the point of the story. Calling this series of events a battle is a bit of a stretch. It wasn't really a battle, right? 
You think of a battle, you think of a war, you think of fighting, you think of violence and, and, and death and, 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 just, and, and gruesome things. It was not really a battle. What it should be called is the obedience of Joshua and the fall of Jericho. But that's not as catchy. So we're going to stick with Joshua and the walls of Jericho, or Joshua and the battle of Jericho. Britannica says of the walls of Jericho, massive stone walls surrounding an ancient Neolithic settlement in Jericho built about 8,000 B.C. These walls, at least 13 feet in height and backed by a watchtower uh, or a fort some 28 feet tall, were intended to protect the settlement and its water supply from human intruders. The weapons of the hunt had been used uh, been in use for centuries, the walls of Jericho represent the earliest technology uncovered by archaeologists that can be ascribed unequivocally to purely military purposes. Uh, translation, this wall was built to be impenetrable. It was built for protection. It was built uh, as, as, a, as a, a defensive mechanism for purely military reasons. Answers in Genesis says of the walls of Jericho, the mound or the tell of Jericho, it was surrounded by a great earthen rampart or an embankment with a stone retaining wall at its base. The retaining wall was some four to five meters or 12 to 15 feet high. On top of that was a mud brick wall six feet thick and about six to eight meters or 20 to 26 feet high. At the crest of the embankment was a similar mud brick wall the base was roughly 46 feet above the ground level outside the retaining wall. In other words, there, it wasn't just a, 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 a you know, we, we imagine this and it's just a, a, a city with, you know, four walls or whatever. <clears throat> In reality, this city was built up and below it were retaining walls and embankments and, 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 and a hill. And so Jericho was really, you know, up here and, and, and the, the, you know, walking around Jericho, you're down here looking, I don't know, 60 feet or more up at least to the top of the wall because you're down at the base of this hill with the retaining wall and behind the retaining wall is another hill and behind that, there's the, there's the city. This is what loomed above the Israelites as they marched around the city each day for seven days. Humanly speaking, it was impossible for the Israelites to penetrate the impregnable bastion of Jericho. Whatever the actual dimensions may have been, the point is that an attempted siege or an invasion was pointless. While nothing about what happened makes natural sense, it certainly makes spiritual sense. Because Joshua obeyed the Lord, and the Lord was faithful to Joshua. The Lord called for Joshua and all of the men of war. These are men who were primed for violence. These are men who were ready to fight. They were ready to do whatever it takes to win. These men of war were asked to march. Not fight. Not draw their swords. Not throw spears. Not fire arrows. March. That's it. You are, you are a, a, a soldier. You, especially in, 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 in early biblical times, there's, <clears throat> these guys were barbaric. I mean, that's what it was. It was very primal. It was very, uh, very visceral. The, the, the way that they approached war. But these are soldiers. These are men of war. The Bible specifically calls it out. that The Lord says, Joshua, take you and your men of war. Your, your soldiers, your, your men who are ready to fight, who are amped up, who, who, want, who, who want nothing more than to take down the enemy and, 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 and shout and, and fight. And I'm, I'm harping on this for a reason. They had to march silently once a day for six days. Men who were used to shouting battle cries to intimidate the enemy marched silently. May I submit to you that this was maybe the greatest test of obedience. These men were amped up to fight, but they needed to submit to Joshua and trust that as little sense that this was making, that Joshua was in fact hearing from the Lord. And so they needed to quell their desire to fight 
in order to obtain victory through obedience. Sometimes our greatest victories come as a result of our self-control and our submission to someone who knows better than we do. And so on the seventh day, worship would precede the marching. And following the the seventh time around the city, the horns would blow and the people would shout and the walls would fall flat, the Bible says. I believe that the, 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 the embankments, the, the retaining walls, the, the way that the, the, the city was set up as a, as a you know, a, 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 as a basically a fortification, that actually worked in the Israelites' favor when the walls fell because the walls fell flat. And so the, the Israelites weren't looking up at hill after hill after hill and, and all, the, all this angle. They could just walk on, on flat ground because the walls had fallen flat just as the Lord said he would do. And... Pastor, you were all over my notes a little while ago. Psalm 47, shout unto, unto God with a voice of triumph. Uh, it implies that the shout could be coming as a result of the victory, but in this instance, the shout was not as a result of the victory, but rather in faith that the victory would come. It was victory through obedience. And, and while there's no mention, uh, at least from what I could find, of, a, of an altar at Jericho, the city in and of itself, it does serve as a reminder of victory through obedience and that God is faithful to keep his promises. Second Kings chapter 2, verse 6, Then Elijah said to him, Stay here. Talking to Elisha, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. Before this, the Jordan had served as a memorial of separation and consecration. After wandering the wilderness for 40 years, an entire generation of Israelites were denied the promised land. It was punishment for their lack of faith. And the Jordan River was the filter that kept them out. In 1 Kings 16, Elijah warned King Ahab of Israel that there would be a drought because of Israel's wickedness. And uh, following this prophecy, God told him to cross to the east side of the Jordan and hide from Ahab. The Jordan served as a barrier to protect Elijah. And long after Elijah was translated to heaven, the Jordan continued to be a means of separation from the world and consecration to the Lord. In 2 Samuel 17, Absalom, David's son, was plotting to kill his father and those who were loyal to him. But David was forewarned, and with his company, he crossed the Jordan, and again, it served as a barrier to protect David and his followers. We also see in 2 Kings uh, 5 that the Jordan was a place of purification. Naaman, uh, he, he, he was leprous, and the prophet said, go wash in the Jordan. Go, go wash seven times in the Jordan. This guy was a decorated officer of, of, of King Aram's army, Right? And he gets super indignant about the whole thing. He's expecting the prophet of God. He says, I, I was thinking you'd come and wave your hand and I'd be healed. I have to go wash in the Jordan? The Jordan River? Super nasty. Okay? Really disgusting. Muddy. Gross. There's all kinds of stuff in there you don't want to know about. So, so this, was, this was not what Naaman had in mind, right? Uh, but... Eventually, he, he, he gives up, he relents and says, okay, fine. And, and, and he goes and dips himself seven times, and his skin became healthy. He, he, he was healed of his leprosy. While numerous altars were built in and around the Jordan, the river itself served as an altar of separation, consecration, and purification. 2 Kings chapter 2, starting in verse 9, when they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I'm taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Elisha replied. Elijah said, You have asked a difficult thing, yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. And as they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses appeared 
and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. And he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. See, Elisha had stayed close to Elijah throughout their time together. And, and I believe that, that while God had sent them to Bethel and to Jericho to minister, this was customary of prophets. They would go from town to town. They would minister, especially where there was a lot of wickedness. The Lord would send them to go, to go preach and, 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 and try to get people to repent. I believe Elisha was being ministered to in the process. The Lord was sending Elijah, saying, go to Bethel, go to Jericho, go to the Jordan. And I believe in each of these cases, Elisha was, was learning a little bit something from the past. He was, he was, he was looking at these altars and these, these landmarks, the, the, this history, and, and reflecting on what had happened there in the past and the great things that God had done in the past, the miracle signs and wonders that God had done, the transformation of lives that, that God had performed in people. Each place they visited was a reminder of the greatness of God. And if God could do that, in the past, why would it be any different now? And Elisha goes on to do even greater works than Elijah does. Uh, remember, I've said this before, that God is an intense God. I don't mean intense like intense, like, you know, intense. I-N dash T-E-N-S-E. Intense. He's in your past. He's in your present, and he's in your future. He's, he's, he's worked in your past. You, you, you see the, the, the things about your past, good or bad, and you can see, looking back, that the Lord has, in fact, had his hand on your life the whole time. And you, and you know he's working in your future. You know he's here and now, and he's setting you up for what's coming in your future. He is an intense God. And if you can look at your life experiences, if you can look at the things that you've been through, the places that you've been, and you look at those through the, the lens of an altar, a, a place of sacrifice, a place of reflection, a place of learning from, from your history. If, if you can look uh, to those things through that lens, you will be altered beyond recognition. Whether they be traumas or milestones, or achievements. They are altars that should be revisited by you and those closest to you. And not to dwell on the past. Not to, again, go back to this, this uh, being stuck in your past, but learning from it, reflecting on it, uh, the, the good and the bad. Uh, the, these, are, these are altars that should uh, serve as a reminder, and it's up to you to leave those altars changed. It's up to you to leave the altar different than when you arrived. It's up to you to have learned and grown from your altars. It's up to you, Joshua, to go back to where you thought you were stuck before an impossible promise, but through obedience to the Lord, you found your victory. It's up to you, David. Uh, it's up to you, Elijah, to go back to where you thought there was no way of escape from your enemies and your life was over. But the Lord used that same obstacle, that same impassable obstacle obstacle to separate you from your enemy because you were consecrated spiritually. It's up to you, Jacob, to realize that sometimes God won't give you your breakthrough after just one encounter because he's waiting to make sure your old habits and your old nature are not leaving the altar with you. Would you stand all across this room? going to open these this altar space up here but <clears throat> I'm going to do it a little bit differently if you are if you are in a place where you're looking to find 
escape, find uh, respite from things that have been tormenting you, things that have been uh, pursuing you, that you don't want in your life anymore. You, you are looking for the Lord to uh, separate the Jordan River in your life so you can get to the other side and, and get away from, from whatever it is that's, that's pursuing you. I want you to, to come up to the front over here off to this side, my, my right, your left. If you are looking to, <clears throat> if you're looking for the Lord to protect you from some stuff, I want you on this side. If you are, if you are looking for change, you're looking for something in your life to be different. You have some, maybe you have some habits you want to get rid of. Maybe you, you have some. Uh, so, something about your, your nature that you know isn't right with the Lord and you want to uh, you want that to change you want to leave some stuff at the altar here today I'm asking you to come up here to, to my left and your right and if you are looking for victory you're looking for the miraculous something that God has promised you. I want you to be obedient. I want you to find that victory through obedience, and I want you to come up to the, the, the middle here in the front. If, if, if you fall into any of those categories, I want you to, to come up to the front right now. This is not to embarrass you, to call you out. This is, this is an opportunity to visit an altar And, and again, there are certain things that happen at an altar. There is worship, and, and there was sacrifice, and there was reflection, and there was was learning. And, and when people left an altar, they were they left different. And so, whatever altar you find yourself at this afternoon, whatever place in your life you find yourself at this afternoon, and if you if you've got it all figured out. I am happy for you, and, and I'm asking that you come up anyway and you find some people to pray with. If, if, the Lord, if, if you are doing well in your spirit, if things are good, I want you to come up anyway, and I want you to find somebody to pray with. Whatever altar you find yourself at, if we can come up a little more, a little closer to the front, there's plenty of room. You just come on in a little bit so we don't clog up the aisles too much there. Whatever altar you find yourself at right now, we're going to start with worship. We're going to start with praise. Just as you would in, in, your, in your prayer time. And you should always begin your prayer time with, with praise and, and worship. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Thank you, Lord, for bringing me to this place. Thank you, Lord. I know that this was a divine appointment. I am not here by mistake. I'm not here by accident. I'm here because you have brought me to this place and I am thankful. I praise you, Lord, for who you are. I praise you for your mighty acts. I praise you for your goodness. I praise you for, for, uh, for your kindness, your love towards me, your grace in my life, Lord. I praise you and I worship you. I thank you, Lord. Lift your voices right now and worship to him. I thank you, Jesus, for who you are. I praise you for who you are. You're worthy. If you never do another thing for me in my life, you're still worthy. I worship you in your majesty, Lord. I worship you in your greatness and in your splendor. I worship you. I worship you. You are holy and you are righteous, O oh Lord. You are awesome in this place and you are awesome in my life. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
us take a, a little bit of time to, to clear some stuff out. Lord, if there's anything in me that's not pleasing to you, I want to leave it at this altar right now. I want to leave it here. I don't want to leave th this altar the same way I walked up. I don't want this time, this experience to be in vain. I don't want this to be a waste of my time. I want to be changed, and I will not let go until you bless me. I will not let go until something changes. I will not relent. I will not relent until, until there, there, there's something different about me. My focus right now, Lord, is to draw closer to you. And if there's anything in my life that is separating me from you, if there's anything in my life that is causing me to be distant from you, I want it out. I don't want it with me anymore. I want to leave it here at this altar. I want to lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset me. If there's anything weighing me down in my spirit, Lord, I lay it at your feet. I lay it at this altar. If there's anything in my life that is sin that is not pleasing to you, I leave it at this altar. When I walk out of here, I want to be beyond recognition. There are people in my life who say, oh, I know how you used to be. And I want it to be like that. Yes, that's how I used to be, but that's not who I am anymore. If there's any bitterness in me, Lord, I leave it at this altar. It's not worth it to carry the weight of bitterness. There are habits in my life that are keeping me from you. It's not worth it. The things that I pursue in this world can't go with me. This earth will pass away, but eternity will be forever. And so I seek you. You are my treasure and my priority. I will seek you and your kingdom first. And rest assured knowing that you will take care of all my needs. not define me. Who I was does not define who I am. There are things that I've learned. There's, there's things that I have grown from. There are things that, good things that I could take away, but I am not who I once was. When I'm in your presence, I am different. I am made new. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new when I am in you, Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. There is Every 
an altar is uh, well the the altar remained for a long time after it was built people it wasn't a permanent settlement people did not stay at the altar forever they they eventually moved on to <clears throat> the next chapter in their lives and I say that to say you know, there, there is a time to stay at the altar and, uh, and seek after the Lord and, and seek that, that change, that transformational change. But there's also a, a time where you do have to, to, to get up and move to that next uh, chapter in your life. And so um, I, I want us to stay in this prayerful uh, atmosphere, but I do want to uh, to move to another chapter and that is victory transformation consecration these, these things that were represented by, by the Jordan and by Jericho and by Bethel uh, I want to uh, take this, this prayer this time of prayer into another uh, chapter here and, and for those of you who were seeking uh, separation from an enemy. You were, you were, you were looking for for safety and refuge from uh, for, for the Lord to part the Jordan, so you could make it to the other side, and, and your enemies would not uh, follow you there. I want you to to begin to rejoice for uh, for for the Lord answering those prayers, and for those of you who are seeking transformation in your life. Those of you seeking something to change in, in your personality or in your habits or, or, or something uh, that, that you, you know isn't pleasing to the Lord and, and you, you've wanted to leave it here at this altar, I want you to begin to rejoice that the Lord is, is going to work on you and change that nature so that you are no longer who you were. You will be defined by who God sees you as. And if you came to this, this altar this afternoon, uh, you were... 
seeking victory through obedience, I want you to begin to, 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 to rejoice in that victory that the Lord has promised you. And so would you, uh, all across this room, begin to, to rejoice, begin to lift your head, lift your eyes, lift your voice to heaven and say, thank you, Lord, for what you've done. Thank you for what you're doing. And thank you for what is yet to come. I've seen what you've done in my past. I kind of see what you're doing right now. And I don't know what you have in store for my future, but I know it's good. I know that you're working all things together for good to those. 